in order to believe that you can lose your salvation, you have to believe two things, two incredibly, amazingly mind-blowing things. One, and let's start with the least most mind-blowing thing, you have to believe that you have the ability to keep yourself safe. You have the ability, you trust in yourself, you have the ability to do what others could not do, what others in the Old Testament could not do. You have the ability to do it. It's up to you. We'll talk about that also, but the other thing that's even more amazing and mind-blowing is you have to believe that God's promises aren't God's promises. What ends up happening is people take these warnings to people who think that they're safe and extrapolate that to apply them to people who are safe. In other words, because people who say they're safe do things and act in ways that are clearly unbecoming for a believer, well then that person lost their salvation. Or if someone says that I used to be saved, now I'm not, we take them at their word. But how about we instead take God at his word? Remember, God is a man that he should not lie. He's not like us. He doesn't lie. Name something that God said that he will do or name something that God said will happen that doesn't happen or name something that God says won't happen that does happen. Remember, this is who our salvation is in in the Lord. He determines what will and what will not be. Why is that important? Well, he speaks about this uh, in Micah 5. Notice what he says about us as being sheep and what the shepherd do. What will happen with the sheep? In Micah 5, 4, he says, and he will arise and shepherd his flock. Hmm. Who does that sound like that he will shepherd his flock? Who is the good shepherd? Well, that is the Lord. He will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. So what will happen? They will remain who? The people, his sheep will, be, will remain. Why? Because we have this great shepherd. So to answer that age old question, that is a ridiculous question. That is, do sheep always stay sheep? Well, Micah says that at this great shepherd, that is Jesus, that his sheep will remain. Why? Because he's the shepherd. In other words, to think that the only sheep that will remain will be the sheep that decide they want to remain sheep, the sheep that decide they will help shepherd themselves. They will do the shepherd one better and keep themselves. As a matter of fact, they brought themselves to the great shepherd. Think about that. Sheep who on their own came to the shepherd. That's not in keeping with the scriptures. As a matter of fact, what does he also say? What is another promise that God gives us in Jeremiah 32? He says, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always. Drop to verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them. So God will not turn away from them. Those who he gives that one heart to the ones who he puts his spirit in their heart. He says, I will not turn away from them. Uh, and he says, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. So he says on one hand, I will not turn away from them, nor will they turn away from me. Now, I know what some folks are thinking. We'll deal with that in just a second. Let's go to this next verse, because these are verses that people simply do not want to answer. What they will do, and I can promise you in the comment section, just go and watch, they won't answer these questions. They'll pick out some other questions, some other passages that we've already covered, but still they will avoid these particular texts. Why? Because there's no answer to these texts. Again, someone will say, well, I don't need to read the Hebrew like you, Corey, or do read the Greek. I'm just reading the English. Is the English enough? What does it say in the English? For example, in Ezekiel 36, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. So what will happen? You will be clean once he does what he is going to do. Moreover, I notice who's doing the work. I will give you a new heart. God will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you. So God will give you a heart of flesh. I, this is the Lord, will put my spirit within you and I, he will cause you, that's us, to walk in his statutes and you will be careful to observe my commandments, his commandments. Now, what does that mean in the English? If he says, I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to walk. Remember, we want to be like Enoch. We want to be like Noah. We want to be like anyone else who God wants us to walk with God. He will cause us to the same Hebrew word. I'm sorry, I did use a Hebrew word. I apologize, but words matter. And sometimes it just helps. The same Hebrew word that means to go with, to walk. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. When? when he puts his spirit in their hearts or our hearts. So what will happen? He will put his spirit in our hearts and will cause us to walk after he puts his spirit in our hearts. So what is going to happen? According to the English, we don't have to focus on the Hebrew, but according to the English, 
what will happen. You will walk in his statutes. Now, as I said before, I know the response. Well, Corey, that's just speaking about Israel. That is not speaking about us, really. Well, let's go to Jesus. You know Jesus, who is the Lord, who is God in flesh. Look what he says. He says, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children. Now, this word right here, I'm sorry, I apologize. I've got to use the Greek, this word, hasoi. This is as many, whomever. That implies not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. Or do we want to say that only the Jews will have the Holy Spirit in them? Is that what we're saying? Only Jews will have the Holy Spirit in them? Or are we saying that when the Holy Spirit is in us, it will act differently and work differently in the Jews and not the same way as the Greeks, as not the same ways as the Gentiles? That makes absolutely no sense. No way, shape, form, or fashion. As a matter of fact, we have all, as Paul said, all been baptized into the same body, into the same spirit, by the same spirit. And so all of us, as Paul says in Romans 8, who are led by the spirit are those who are the children of God. If you don't have the spirit, you're not his child, be you Jew or Greek. Salvation comes to the Jew first, but also to the Greek the same way. How? By placing faith in Christ. And what do you receive? You receive the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is speaking of in John 3 when he speaks about the spirit coming and regenerating your heart. And he says, this is what the term comes from being born again, born from above, born of the spirit, born of God. That is not, that's not a work that you do. You don't cause that to happen. You don't make yourself be born again. We'll talk about that in a second. It's God that does so. And notice what he says, going back to John 1, he says to those who believe in his name, who were. So those who believe, anyone that believes, or I should say is believing, that's the Greek participle that's been used here. Those of us who are believing, because the Bible refers to us who are believers as those who are in a state of continual believing. That's why we use the present active participle. But he says those who are believing in his name are the ones who were born. This is past tense, not of God, not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man. But what were they born of? They were born of God. Ekthu Eganethesen. I'm sorry again. Once again, I'm using Greek, but the English should be clear. Those who believe are those who were born of God, not of your own desire, not of your genealogy, your flesh or anything like that. But you were born of God, of his own desire. And before someone says, well, no, we are born again because we place our faith in Christ. We did something. No. Look what Paul, what, what Peter says in first Peter one, verse three. He says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. I don't need to look at the Greek here. What does your English say? Since many people don't think that we should ought to need the Greek, and in most cases you don't, the Greek does make things clearer. So too does the Hebrew. So too does the Aramaic, the small bit of Aramaic that we have in the Bible. They help to make the understanding a little clearer. If there's some sort of uh, discussion, confusion, or debate as to what a English word means, well, don't you think the Greek should matter? Since after all, it was given to us in Hebrew and Greek. But I digress. Going back to the English, he says, God caused us to be born again to a living hope, not us. This is what God does. And so we're talking about the promises of God. And if you are a believing one, which comes about because you were born of God and you were born of God because God caused you to be born, which is what he says he'll put his spirit in us. He says you will walk in that way. As a matter of fact, what does Jesus say? Jesus, his promise again. Remember Jesus. He is the Lord. He is God. Let's look at what his promises are, for he puts forth all his own. That is Jesus. He goes forth ahead of them and the sheep will and the sheep follow him. Why? Because he, they know his voice. Jesus makes this statement. He says the sheep follow. Then he says even more to it, a stranger. They simply will not follow. Remember, this is the same God who says he is not a man that he should lie. So he says the sheep will not follow a stranger or a strange voice. But what will they do? They will flee. This is the English. They will not follow and they will flee from the stranger. And he even tells us why. Because they do not know the stranger's voice. And you can still bring up that he's talking about the Jews, but no, he's not speaking of the Jews only because let's go down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd. Well, let's go back to where we first talked about the good shepherd. 
So let's go back to Micah and let's look before we get to verse four. Let's make sure we know that he's clearly speaking about Jesus. He says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah from you, one will go forth from me, I mean, for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from days of eternity. So clearly we are speaking about the Lord. And what does he say? And he will arise and shepherd his flock and they, the flock, will remain. Going back to John 10, this shepherd, he says uh, in verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me, I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. Who are the other sheep? That would be the Gentiles, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And look what he says in the English. They will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. He goes on to say that these particular sheep, they will never, ever, ever perish. He gives them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now, I want you to think about something. One of the most famous passages that we can bring up is John 3, 16. In the old covenant, it was that you can be justified before the Lord on this day. Your sins can be atoned for this day. This part is indisputable. You can be atoned for today and sometime in the future during the law, you can seek to be atoned for. You can be justified today and not be justified later. Well, do we think we have the exact same situation now that under this dispensation? Now we've got the blood of Christ. We've got a better high priest. We've got a better scapegoat. We've got a better atonement, a better blood sacrifice. And the exact same situation is still present. You can be justified today and not be justified tomorrow under the old covenant. And the exact same thing holds true. You can be justified today and not be justified tomorrow or atoned for today and not be atoned for tomorrow. Same as it was in the old, or you can be saved today and not be saved tomorrow under the old. Just like now you can be saved today and not be saved tomorrow under this new dispensation, under this, under, under the cross, under the, after the blood. Are you telling me that after all that God has done, to send his son to die on the cross, to shed his blood. We have the exact same situation today that you can lose your standing in the Lord because of sin. Well, then that makes no sense. What does the Holy Spirit do? Remember, he says, once I put my spirit in you, you won't turn away and it will cause you to walk in my statutes. As a matter of fact, Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, that for those of us who love him, he will cause everything to work for our good. So whatever it is in the word, all, all things, everything, you name it, whatever it's going to be, it's going to cause to be worked for our good. That is for those who love him. That is for those who are in Christ. And so what we do is it going to take us away. Well, that would not be for our good. That would not be keeping with Romans 8. So going back to what he says, he says they will become one flock with one shepherd. And that's why he gives us eternal life. And that's why he says in John 3 that whoever it is, all the ones that are believing in him will never perish. Because in the past, if you were believing, uh, if you stopped believing at that point, you could perish. And so what is God's remedy? To put his spirit in us and cause us to walk in his statue. Those are his promises. How about another promise? John 6, 37. All that the father gives me. Now notice all, that's all in English, all, whoever it is that happens to be given to, to Jesus by the father, he says, will come. We don't have to use the Greek we can use the English. The English is pretty clear. The Greek is clearer. The Greek is stronger. But he says, will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. In other words, all the ones that the father gives, he will not cast out. Why? Because they will come to him. For I've come down to do the will, not of my own will, but of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given, all, what does he say? All of them that he has given me, I will lose none. Help me to understand how Jesus is incorrect. Help me to understand how, as you guys would say, some of those who disagree, help me to understand how the English doesn't, no longer makes any sense. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. As a matter of fact, if we drop down a little further, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him who sends me, and I will raise him in the last day. And look at verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you that he who believes, this is the, the uh, present active participle, the believing one, he has, present tense, this is the English, has what? Life eternal. That is life going on into the ages. And now this is where we can look into the Greek. 
Eke Zoane Ionia. He has life into the ages. When does he have? What does he have? He has life. When does he have it? Now. How long does the life last? Into the ages. That part should be pretty easy to understand. And we're just really focusing mainly on the English, just like in John 5, 24. John 5, 24 says, truly, truly, I say to you that he who hears my words and believes, he used the present active participle, so the one that's hearing and believing, which he describes as a believer. You are not a believer if you are not believing. A true believer is in a state of continual believing, which is why he keeps using this present active participle. He, him who sent me, that person, there it is again, present active he has right now life into the ages. And look what he says, does not, he does not come into, into judgment. Remember, he says that he is not a God that should not lie. And so it would be a lie if you say that now all of a sudden that person will go into judgment. Jesus says that person does not go into judgment. As a matter of fact, to do it even one better, he says, but has passed out of death. This is, this is by the way, a perfect tense. I understand we've got to stop for a second, do a little bit of Greek. This is a perfect, this perfect tense is a past completed action, meaning for us, it's basically a past action. They will have already passed from death. And so if we were to enter death again, even after Jesus says we pass out of that, away from that and into life, that's not in keeping with what he says here or with what the word says in Numbers 23, 19. That is that he is not a man that he should not lie. But he's not lying. We have passed from death. We will never see death. Instead, we are going into life. Why? Because we're overcomers. Why do we say that? Because in 1 John 5, look what he says. Whoever believes, that one, the one that's believer, and all the ones that's believing, that's what it is, pass up his one, all the ones who are believing that Jesus is Christ, those are the ones who are born of God. And it's a perfect tense. So those are the ones who have been born of God and whoever loves the father loves a child born. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. Now, are we going to observe his commandments? Well, we were told that once we once he puts a spirit in us, he will cause us to do what? To walk in his commandments. I will put my spirit within you, Ezekiel 36, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So that's exactly what he's speaking of in John. So you'll have the spirit in you. And you will walk in his statutes, in his ordinances, in his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Look what he says. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So the ones that's born of God, all the ones that are born of God overcomes the world. So if you are born of God, and we've already discovered that if you're born of God, God caused you to be born again. God caused you to be born from above. Not you, but God. And if he's caused you to be born again, what will you also do? You will overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, our faith um, is triggered by us being born again, having a regenerated heart. And who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. And how do we do so? Because we have been born from above. And because of that, he says in chapter, chapter three, verse five of Revelation, he gives a strong emphatic statement. He says, he who overcomes, well, who's the one that overcomes? The one that's been born again. Who's the one that's been born again? The one that's been born from above, caused by God to do so. He who overcomes will thus be clothed. You will be clothed in white garments. And he says, I will not erase their name from the book of life. Somebody's going to come back and say, well, see, there's a possibility. That means you must overcome first in order to have your name or not have your name erased. That's not what it says at all. The promise is that you will never, ever, ever have your names blotted out. He says, Ume, now the word for to be blotted out or to erase is where exalipso, which is to be blotted out. But Ume is an emphatic negation of a future act of indignity, meaning never, ever, ever in the future will your name ever be blotted out. So this is before you actually get to see heaven. This is during this time. So the overcoming ones, they're overcoming ones because they believe, but they're believers because they're overcoming ones because they've been born again. So if you've been born again, you are believing. And if you're believing, you're overcoming. And he says, you will never, ever, ever have your name blotted out. In order to think that then you can turn around and come back and say, it is still possible for you to lose your salvation, means that every single thing that God just said is a lie, that he was wrong. Or, and notice, it's not using the Greek to change anything around. This is simply the English. And when he says he will do something, he will do something. Or maybe you take it to mean that when he says he will do it, he really means you will do it. He will. He who started this good thing in you, as Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, 
Uh, he's confident that he who began a good work in you, that he will complete it. Maybe what you're taking is that you will complete it. Maybe you started this work. It's the audacity of ignorance to turn around and say that it's up to you to maintain your salvation. Do you have to remain? Sure. Or do you have to abide? Sure. Do you have to bear fruit? Sure. Do you have to keep believing? Sure. Do you have to keep hearing and keep following? Sure. The question is, will you? Yes, you will. God will cause you to do all of those things. As a matter of fact, Luke 8, Jesus says, because the word was given to you on a in a good heart, and the heart is given to you, the heart is made good because of what God does, then he says, you will bear fruit with perseverance. That means it will continue. You will continue to bear fruit. Now, will your fruit um, be as evident as the next person? Maybe, maybe not. That's between you and God. But the fact is, if you are, and here's the big if, that is, if you are genuinely saved, if you have genuinely placed your faith in Christ, you can have confidence that you are going to be in heaven. Why is that important? Corey, this is an age old argument. We're going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But the fact of the matter is, the reason why this is important is because you need your confidence in this day, because the world is going to come at you to shake you to see if uh, you are of the world or of them. And they might give you something to kind of give you to think, make you think that, you know what, I sinned last night or I had a thought last night. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I should not speak up loud. Maybe I shouldn't tell someone about the goodness of Christ because I don't live the way that I'm supposed to live all the time. No, you tell someone about the goodness of Christ because you don't live the way you're supposed to live all the time, but you're working on it. You're getting there. You're growing. And because he's working in me, he can do the same in you. But Corey, this has always been the case. It's always been an argument uh, from the very beginning of the church up till now. As a matter of fact, some will say that no early church father ever believed this. This is a new belief. Well, as I'm reading, I'm going to put up some quotes from early church fathers who disagree. There is no such thing as a, a unanimous belief amongst any of the early church fathers. As a matter of fact, some of the early church fathers, as a matter of fact, most of the early church fathers were wrong in their assessment of Jesus' return. They thought that he was going to return for the most part during their lifetime. And so they were wrong. So this beholding, this listening to them as though they're the authorities, they didn't write scripture. They're just like us trying to interpret, trying to understand. As a matter of fact, many of them were modalists. There were those who were Trinitarian as though most of us are, but there were those who were modalists. The reason why I'm saying this is though, don't rely on what someone said, rely on what the word says, particularly in this case, what Jesus says, what God says, what the word says, let that be the truth. And if you want to reject this and you want to be the one that wants to hold your salvation in your own hands, that you're responsible for your own salvation, I say to you, good luck. Why would you say good luck, Corey? We're Christians. We don't believe in luck. Well, you must believe in luck because if you don't believe in the power of God, you believe in the power of yourself. I wish you good luck. You are relying on something outside of the Lord and I wish you good luck. I hope it's well with you. I pray, though, that you will find out one day that it's not you, that it's really the Lord that's sustaining you. And you'll come to the conclusion that all the times that you have messed up in your life, you have screwed up beyond belief in your life. You are a walking ball of mess. And to come back and have the audacity to say that the walking ball of mess, the miserable foolishness that you are and I am, the biggest, most incompetent goofballs that there ever were who are now saved in Christ. We suck at being Christians, but we are still here because of the goodness of the Lord. Then to turn around and take credit for us being here, I think it's an outright offense and a slap in the face figuratively of the Lord. But then again, it's a good thing that we need him because we are so stupid, so ignorant as to think that we merit this salvation. There's nothing good about us. And if you think that you merit salvation, then take heed that your righteousness does not exceed that of the, of, the, of the scribes and Pharisees. And if your righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you can in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you want to rely on yourself, if you think it's up to you, good luck. If you want to believe the promises of God, well then amen. And I say walk confidently in that salvation. Amen. Amen.